in the wake of this clear signal that the population is sending, how will the elites respond, primarily the military, given the say that they have in the country? Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast for the foreign policy and global development communities and anyone who wants a deeper understanding of what is driving events in the world today. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg. I am a veteran international affairs journalist and the editor of UN Dispatch. Enjoy the show. On May 14th, Thailand held general elections and the results were a shock to the Thai political system. Since a 2014 coup, military leaders have dominated Thai politics. A main opposition party has challenged military rule, but has generally been thwarted at every turn. However, this year, a third party emerged victorious, and their vision for the country represents a radically progressive shift in Thai politics. The Move Forward Party is led by a charismatic Harvard and MIT-educated 42-year-old Pita Limjeroenrat. They convincingly won this election, and they did so, according to my guest today, by channeling a kind of progressive populism that can change Thailand's domestic political culture and foreign policy in big ways. Prashanth Paramiswarn is a fellow at the Wilson Center and founder of the ASEAN Wonk Substack newsletter. We kick off discussing the political context in which Move Forward won these elections. We then have an extended conversation about how the military junta has rigged the Thai political system in such a way that the Move Forward party may never actually be able to form a government. And even if they did, the threat of a coup would loom large. We then have an extended conversation about what this election means in terms of Thai foreign policy and geopolitical competition in Southeast Asia between the U.S. and China. I encourage folks to sign up for the ASEAN Wonk Substack newsletter. And while you're at it, you should, of course, be a email subscriber to Global Dispatches on Substack. And you can do so by going to globaldispatches.substack.com. I'll post a link to it in the show notes of this episode. Now, here is my conversation with Prashanth Paramiswarn, fellow at the Wilson Center and founder of ASEAN Wonk. Can I have you explain why the election results were so extraordinary? Why was Move Forward's victory so earth-shaking in the context of Thai politics? So I think to start, just important to kind of frame the importance and the significance of the election, because I think sometimes Thailand is kind of portrayed in the headlines as kind of a minnow, a country that is sort of fledgling between various military coups and so on and so forth. And I think it's important to keep in mind, you know, Thailand is just outside of you know the top 20 populous countries in the world. It's the second largest economy in Southeast Asia, and it's one of just five U.S. treaty alliances in Asia as we're talking about this dynamic of U.S.-China competition and so on and so forth. So it's an extremely significant country. And I, I learned recently in, in a book I'm reading about like the history of the region that the United States and Thailand established diplomatic relations back in like the 19th century, one of the first countries in the region to establish diplomatic relations with the U.S. That's right. That's a really important point that you bring up. There's often a reference to the security alliance that is in the 20th century. But way before that, there was you know commerce that was going on, trade. The United States was actively sending advisors to advise Thailand. And Thailand's also the only country in Southeast Asia to have not been officially colonized. And that is, you know, not by accident. I think there was a lot of diplomatic maneuvering that Thai leaders were doing with respect to that. So this is a country that's very used to managing its domestic politics that are very complicated on the one hand, and then also managing the dynamics of the international system on the other. So that I think is a really important point to keep in mind. And I think on your question about move forward and the victory, I think the current election is, it's important to view it in the context of sort of a really a decades-long struggle in Thailand between 
how do you balance sort of elite sources of legitimacy and popular sources of legitimacy? And that, in terms of elite sources of legitimacy in Thailand, that's meant the monarchy and the military and the bureaucracy. And that tension between that sort of elite sources of legitimacy and popular sources of legitimacy, the population, and really huge societal changes that Thailand has seen over the past few decades really is the tension that we're dealing with. So Move Forward's victory in terms of its significance is important because I think before the election, there was a clear sense that there was a demand for something that's different beyond the current military government. There hadn't been an election that had been held since 2019. So there was a quest for change. But very few people predicted that Move Forward, which is a progressive party within the context of Thailand, would emerge as the largest victor in the elections by far, that it would get this kind of margin of victory. And that's exactly what it did. So this is really the first time that we've seen a progressive party in Thailand register such significant gains, not just in terms of the number of seats, but really if you look at the margin of victory in Bangkok, they won almost all the seats except just one. And that was replicated throughout various parts of the country Move Forward has been seen, you know, previous to the election as being sort of this party that was affiliated with the youth and the younger generation. But even if you look at the demographic data, they perform very well across the board. I think it does speak to this larger than anticipated demand for change in Thailand or something that's different. So that is very important because in this notion of the contestation between elite sources of legitimacy and popular sources of legitimacy, when you have the population have such a clear message, you have the military ruled government now having to make a decision about how is it going to, there's going to be a few more weeks before they officially certify and manage the results, and then they have to select somebody to lead the country. There's been some shenanigans that have gone on in Thailand in the past, the military intervening, you know, Thailand's got about 12 successful coups since 1932. It averages about one coup per decade or less. And so this notion of intervention that is preventing the voice of the population from speaking is something we've seen before in Thailand. And I think that's the big question. In the wake of this clear signal that the population is sending, how will the elites respond, primarily the military, given the say that they have in the country? You referred a few times now to move forward as quote unquote progressive. What does progressive mean in a Thai political context? And how is that in contrast to the way things are, say, currently done? This is a very important point because essentially what move forward has suggested relative to either the military ruled and backed parties in the election or more conservative parties, are very bold measures. So, for example, making reforms to Thailand's constitution, making it clear that you know Thailand has provisions that if you say something that's critical of the monarchy, there will be charges that will be brought against you. So looking at amending that, which challenges directly one of the major longstanding institutions in Thailand, which is the monarchy. And then also ending military conscription which directly gets at the military. So, you know, their pre-election platform and what they had been saying before the election really took aim at the various sources of elite rule in Thailand and talked about fundamentally reforming that such that they would actually cater more to the popular voices within Thailand as well. So this is coming in in a time where they've won this major margin of victory and There's some math that they have to navigate in terms of forming a majority before getting to a government. The question is going to be, how do they balance those bold proposals that they made before the election with compromises that may need to make, or maybe they decide not to make them in the post-election context so they will actually govern? And then the other piece of that is, we do have a record in Thailand previously of governments that have won elections, gone on to rule, but they're deposed in a coup a few years later or there's instances of instability, ouster, parliamentary maneuvering, and so on and so forth. So the question is not only just the initial compromises, but also how long and sustainable the government will be in that context. So as opposed to the more conservative or military-led parties, which propagate more of a respect and deference to institutions like the monarchy, you know, making it clear that the military's role will remain untouched, 
That is not what Move Forward had claimed before the election. So you just referenced sort of the math challenge that will confront Move Forward as it seeks to try to form a new government. And we are currently speaking in this kind of weird period after the elections, but before a government has been formed. And there's a lot of commentary I'm seeing in the media that, in fact, the challenge of forming a new government may be exceedingly difficult, if not insurmountable, because of that math issue. And as I take it, there are something like 750 total seats, including the upper and lower chamber, and one needs a simple majority of 376 in order to form a government. But that half of those seats, I believe, are in the upper chamber, which are mostly dominated and controlled by the military. Could you just explain this challenge as you understand it right now? Yeah, so... What you referred to as the sort of math challenge is the fact that there are about 500 seats in the lower house and 250 seats in the upper house. In the upper house, the 250 seats are essentially military-appointed seats. So if you do the math, you not only have to just win a majority of those seats, you have to make sure that the upside scenario, you kind of win past those 250 and you get a majority of the 500 seats, which amounts to 376 seats is what you need to win. That's a very high bar to clear. And, you know, obviously that math, it's not set in stone. So those 250 appointed seats in the upper house, you know, perhaps there might be some of them that might, you know, change their minds if they see where the political winds are blowing and so on and so forth. So that can be navigated. So that's the math challenge in terms of what move forward has to do. And so it has to form a coalition with other parties to do that. Now, going back to the earlier point we were talking about, they may have to perhaps make some compromises on some of the proposals they had pre-election in order to do that. And they also have to be careful that they're not overplaying their hand. And you know, perhaps the military back parties and the other conservative parties may look to try to form some sort of minority coalition that may not sustainably last, but that may affect how Move Forward plays its cards as well. So there really is, as you say, we're in this kind of odd period where there's going to be some sort of political negotiation that has to be made. The other aspect of that is, I guess, complementary to the math problem, is the engineering problem, right? Which is, in spite of the math, and even if Move Forward does manage to get this coalition together, there are still some questions about whether some form of either military intervention or judicial intervention could occur. And there's past precedents for this, right? So Move Forward is essentially the successor to the Future Forward Party, which won uh, much higher than anticipated margins in the previous Thai election. That party was eventually outlawed. And so then Future Forward was formed you know, after Move Forward. So we've kind of seen this before, where we have sort of a more progressive party outperforming what folks thought it might garner in the election, and then some sort of engineering that prevents it from actually taking power. And I think there are worries that it could happen now. Now, I would say, based on the outcome that had happened, as I said, Move Forward got a very, very high margin in terms of the number of seats that it won. If you look at what the leaders have been saying, their messaging strategy, it's all been around this you know, almost relentless push for sort of saying, you know, it'd be very disastrous if this outcome is not respected. You know, this is a very clear margin. So this is something which I think is very different from the situation we found ourselves before. But nonetheless, the same questions will be asked only because Move Forward is not simply saying, you know, we want to govern and, you know, we're going to keep the status quo. They're proposing clear changes to the institutions in Thailand that, you know, have some popular support, but also within the elites, naturally, there will be some nervousness about what this means for Thai domestic politics. Who is the leader of Move Forward? And going back to your earlier point about the important role that Thailand plays in the region, what do we know about his foreign policy predilections? With Move Forward, Pita Lomjarit, who's the leader of the Move Forward party, is you know an extremely charismatic, outsized figure, graduated from Harvard, you know, very active on social media and espousing a very sort of internationalist approach 
to Thai foreign policy that sort of talks about, you know, we have to be principled in international relations. You know, if we're seeing something like Russia's invasion of Ukraine, you know, Thailand shouldn't just be hedging its bets as it's doing now. We should really speak out on this more clearly because we're a small country and this could potentially happen to us. And we should, you know, have very clear notions around this. On democracy and human rights, we're seeing a situation in Myanmar, which is a very sad situation that's going on with the civil war. Pita has said Thailand should be more active in terms of promoting sort of humanitarian assistance, working within the association of Southeast Asian nations, the regional grouping in Southeast Asia, to be more active on this front and take more leadership. So he's espousing a, a sort of very internationalist notion of Thai foreign policy, which, I mean, there's some components of it that you could argue even the military-backed government you know, has espouses a variation of that. But it's been very difficult for the military to espouse that approach, particularly in the initial few years, because they were dealing with a huge legitimacy crisis when they took power following the coup. So, you know, Thailand over the past decade or so has moved closer to China. Some of that's been arrested a little bit with what the United States and the Biden administration has been doing. And Thailand is a treaty ally. So no matter what it does with China, it still pales in comparison to what it did with the United States. But nonetheless, on China, on Russia's invasion of Ukraine, on Myanmar, we have seen Thailand take more of a sort of hedged position and have to really think about domestic political implications for the regime and the ruling elites because of the nature and form of its government. And I think Pita is espousing a very different notion of that. Now, that's very appealing in Southeast Asia because in addition to the fact that you know democracy hasn't really been a, few, a good few decade or so for democracy in Southeast Asia, if you look at Myanmar, for example, that was on a good trajectory. That's gotten a bit worse. Malaysia, you've got a good story with Anwar Ibrahim as prime minister, but it's averaged about a new government every year or, or two in the last few years, right? Different prime ministers coming in and out. Indonesia is headed for elections next year. Cambodia is heading for elections where Hun Sen is you know, set to kind of prolong his legacy and his squashing opposition. So Thailand is this kind of case where people are looking for, you know, is this potentially a change? That matters because Thailand has had a very outsized leadership role in Southeast Asia. So in addition to being the second largest economy, if you look historically, Thailand played a very critical role in the sort of advancement of ASEAN. It was actually in Bangkok where, you know, ASEAN sort of promulgated the initial years in which, you know, some of the movements towards community building were taken. And the founding declaration of ASEAN, the Bangkok Declaration, is actually named after Bangkok, right? So this is a country that plays a very important role in Southeast Asia. And within the context of U.S.-China competition, as I said, if you're a U.S. policymaker and you're, and you're looking at mainland Southeast Asia, you've got Cambodia and Laos moving closer to China, you've got Myanmar in the midst of civil war, Vietnam and Thailand are the two countries that really matter a lot when it comes to positioning with respect to China. And in the case of Vietnam, you have a one-party communist party, right? So there's going to be some challenges to that, irrespective of the strategic outlook. But in Thailand, there's always this sort of notion of promise around a more democratic government, a more like-minded partner. That hasn't been the case over the last few years. And the U.S.-Thai alliance, they've been able to make some inroads. But there is this notion of perhaps greater strategic alignment um, if move forward comes to power. I mean, it sounds like pizza would be sort of an ideal person from an American perspective, you have a person who espouses these kind of liberal internationalist progressivism that sort of sits at the heart of the U.S. notions for the world. And as you noted, you know, it is potentially could be an anchor of stability in the region. What do we know about how China is approaching these elections. And, you know, from Beijing's perspective, is a PETA led government something to which they may be wary? I mean, I think for China, as well as I think for the United States and other international actors, I think the big question in Southeast Asia, the way you framed it, Mark, which I like, is you know, you do have these leaders that emerge. You know, you had Aung San Suu Kyi in Myanmar, you have Anwar Ibrahim in Malaysia, you now have potentially Pita in Thailand. The question is always, I mean, even if these leaders come to power, they do really well, do the domestic forces at play allow them to actually exercise the kind of vision that they want? 
And are they also able to navigate the domestic politics as they navigate the sort of foreign policy components of that? So you can have a good vision internationally, but you also need to make sure the domestic dynamics are navigated. So I think that's the big question moving forward. And I think China is looking at this, you know, quite cautiously, right? So they're seeing, you know, you had the the coup in Myanmar that happened, which required some recalibration on their part. You had the Malaysian election last year that brought Anwar Ibrahim to power, which required some recalibration on their part as well. And now you have Thailand, another big country, and then you have Indonesia next year, right? Two of Southeast Asia's biggest economies going to elections where there's going to be some change in government. So I think Beijing will be very cautious in sort of seeing how does this vision that PETA has translate into reality? And I think the sort of more cynical take on this would be you know, the military and the monarchy will always exercise some degree of influence, irrespective of who is governing the country in Thailand. And so the big question is going to be, how is he going to navigate that? And on the specifics of the U.S.-China competition, you know, Peter has been very careful to sort of say, we're going to advance economic cooperation with China because it's important. And one of his big priorities is to shore up Thailand's economy because it's become a much more competitive place within Southeast Asia for Thailand to compete. So a few decades ago, you know, Thailand was you know, among one of the largest sort of receivers of foreign direct investment. It's a much more complicated environment now because countries like Vietnam, which were trailing behind Thailand, are now registering among the highest growth rates, not just in Southeast Asia, but in all of Asia more generally. So it's a more competitive environment. It's a more contested geopolitical environment. And so he does want to advance that economic dimension of that relationship. But he also very clearly says, I mean, Move Forward's pre-election agenda platform clearly mentions promoting peace and democratic values in the way that Thailand moves with its alignments. And that very clearly suggests that there would be a little bit more caution in terms of how far they move with China. Now, again, how does this translate to reality is the big question. I think 20 years ago, if you were to say, Thailand was buying Chinese submarines as a U.S. treaty ally. I think you would have been left out of the room, but that's what's happened under the military government. I mean, they've entered into a series of agreements with China. They have exercises now that are going on with Beijing that are some of the biggest in Southeast Asia thus far. I would imagine that part of that reason is that the United States likely cut off military aid, I would imagine, after 2014, owing to U.S. legislation requiring the cutting off of military aid to countries that have had a coup. That's right. That's an important indicator, as you mentioned, about the interrelationship between domestic politics and foreign policy. So because you saw this coup in Thailand, the United States had to take certain measures. And then Thailand and the junta in response took other measures, including reaching out to China and other countries to kind of balance that. Now, the big question is now U.S.-Thailand relations have recalibrated a little bit They sort of drafted and released a new communique looking out in terms of a vision for the alliance. They're making more inroads in terms of security cooperation. But those relationships with China, once you start out, they're sticky. You you can't just unravel them because of domestic political considerations. So I think that's the big concern for Thailand. It's been this sort of notion where for much of the 21st century, Thailand's foreign policy has been almost subordinated to domestic Uh, political considerations and regime changes. Are we going to see perhaps a little bit more political stability that will allow Thailand more freedom and leverage to exercise international leadership and a more internationalist vision in the coming years? Or are we going to see a variation of what we've seen in the past few decades, right? Because again, we've seen this playbook before, right? The former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawatra, who came to power in the 2000s, was a very populist leader and then was ousted in the coup. And this is kind of where we have sort of ended up. So I think that's why you're seeing a little bit more caution from more seasoned observers of Thailand about, you know, let's see where this goes. And there's a lot of good rhetoric about potential change. But the real story in Thailand, in terms of its domestic politics, has been one of continuity rather than change, in spite of the fact that the calls for reform, the calls for societal change are actually growing louder among the population. And it's, I mean, it's kind of a similar trend we see throughout parts of Southeast Asia and really, I mean, other countries too, including the U.S., which is, you know, institutions really being stressed by the demands of society and the population, and they kind of need to change. And the extent to which they change are sometimes a lot slower than the demands for what that change should be. Prashant, thank you so much for your time. This was very helpful. Thanks. Great to be with you.
Thank you for listening to Global Dispatches. Our show is produced by me, Mark Leon Goldberg, and edited and mixed by Levi Sharp. If you have questions or comments, please email us using the contact button on globaldispatchespodcast.com. Before you go, do take a moment to show your support for the show by becoming a premium subscriber. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, you can do so with a couple taps of your thumb. If you're listening elsewhere, you can go to patreon.com slash global dispatches. We rely on support from listeners to continue to do what we do far into the future. And by becoming a premium subscriber, you will unlock access to our entire archive of hundreds and hundreds of episodes. Please rate or review the show on Apple Podcasts. <laughs>